Good morning from uh, Geneva on this uh, second day of the Sustainable Development Impact Summit of the World Economic Forum, which is taking place digitally, also in the context of the UN uh, General Assembly. A warm welcome to all of you to this session titled Global Implications of the European uh, Green Recovery. I'm here in the studio with the president of the World Economic Forum, Borge Brende, and we're excited to have with us such a distinguished panel of speakers on this important topic. Of course, we're particularly honored to have with us the Prime Minister of Belgium, Alexander de Croo. A warm welcome. And uh, we will have with us also today Fike Sibesma, Chairman of the Supervisory Board, Royal Philips, the Netherlands. A warm welcome. Alison Martin, Chief Executive Officer, Europe, Middle East, Africa, and Bank Distribution, Zurich Insurance Group. And last but not least, uh, Stefan Scheible, Global Managing Partner at Roland Berger. Um, this session builds on the work, the hard work of a very specific uh, special community, very impact-driven community of the CEO Action Group for the European Green Deal, which is chaired uh, by Fike Sibesma and Thomas Buberl. So I'd just like to recognize the work of this group. So without further ado, uh, let me give the floor uh, to the president of the World Economic Forum, Borge Brende, to officially start the session. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Mirek, and um, welcome to all our uh, panelists, uh, great panel. Let me uh, start uh, with you, uh, Prime Minister, uh, Prime Minister Alexander uh, de Croo. We uh, saw uh, during the summer uh, terrible floods uh, in Belgium, uh, also in Germany, uh, the rest of uh, Europe. It was a reminder uh, for all of us uh, that the cost of inaction far exceeds the cost of action when it comes to climate change. It's not really anymore about uh, why, but it is about how. And I did last evening a look at your plan in Belgium, and it seems like almost 50% of uh, the fiscal stimulus is now allocated into a green transition uh, for your country. So it would be very interesting, uh, Prime Minister, at the start of this uh, discussion, also in the run-up uh, to the incredibly important uh, COP26 in Glasgow, to really hear about how you are planning uh, to really advance uh, net zero uh, for your country. We know that Europe is already have this big ambition of being the first net zero continent by 2050. Over to you and welcome. Well, first of all, Berge, thank you for the invitation. It's always a pleasure to, uh, to, to use the, the, the World Economic Forum to discuss topics, especially uh, uh, this one, uh, which I think over, um, yes, over this summer really has moved into, uh, into the minds of everyone. Uh, throughout Europe and actually throughout the world, all of us have been confronted with, uh, with weather phenomena which, which um, opened the eyes of even the last ones who were doubting on the impact of, uh, of climate change. And also economically, just one element, uh, agriculture in Belgium, high, highly intensive agriculture. Uh, we've seen that over the last five years uh, in a lot of crops, actually the, uh, the productivity has gone down. Whereas over the last decades, every year, we would see a gradual uh, augmentation of, uh, of productivity. So it's in the minds of people, but it's also in the economic heart of our, of our society uh, today. Now, how do, we, uh, how do we do this? We are deeply convinced that um, a technology and innovation is going to be the way we get out of this. And we will, we as humans, we've never solved our biggest challenges by uh, putting progress in reverse. Uh, we will only do it by shift a few gears up in, uh, in, using, uh, in using technology. And just giving you a few uh, concrete elements. Uh, one, for example, is in, uh, in zero emission cars. Uh, we've taken a decision that by 2026, all our uh, corporate fleets uh, needs to be zero emission. That is approximately 15% uh, of, uh, of the total of the car fleet mandatory zero emission by 2026. That is actually quite, uh, quite soon. Um, other element is, is, for example, in, in offshore wind. Uh, offshore wind, we are today 
uh, the number four worldwide in installed uh, capacity, which for a country with a rather small coastline is, uh, is, is, is remarkable. We have done that by creating an ecosystem that was very attractive for, uh, for our economy uh, to invest in this. And we've created a whole sector that is basically uh, installing offshore wind farms throughout the world uh, today. The main point that I want to make here is that as a government, now really is the time where you can create a framework in which uh, economic actors um, can take actions which are the right actions from, uh, from a human perspective, but also the right actions from an economic perspective. Uh, it is clear that if you want to take steps forward, um, it also needs to, to make business sense and making sure that it makes business sense, well, that is a, that is a task for governments. Well, thank you. Um, we know that uh, the EU and Europe is also uh, playing an incredibly important role uh, in the diplomacy on the green uh, transition, uh, net zero by 2050. And we know that this incredibly important uh, COP26 is <laughs> approaching uh, in Glasgow. I guess uh, you're planning uh, also uh, to uh, go. Uh, how do you see uh, know, uh, the prospects uh, for a successful outcome? Are you concerned that the latest uh, geopolitical uh, developments uh, can uh, also have a negative impact on this? Because we know that the relationship between the G2 is very important uh, to get the deal. It's also a question of uh, phasing out coal. It's a question of uh, can you uh, peak by 2030 or not. So it would be very interesting to hear uh, your take on the prospects uh, for COP26. For me, there, there's no doubt. Uh, COP26 needs to be successful and, and, and geopolitics really cannot play a role in, in, in that. I think everyone has very high expectations of that, uh, of that summit. As a European Union, obviously, we, we, we will be playing a leading role in, uh, in, in, in that. The ambitions of the uh, European Union are, are, are very clear. Um, also on the role we play outside of our borders. And because at some point people could say, well, but if we go for a very sustainable life or very sustainable society in the European Union, is that going to move the needle? Um, because we're only not such a big part of the, of the world population. Well, it's not only our behavior that will move the needle. What will move the needle is our technology. And our technology can save, uh, can save the world. I think everyone in the European Union is now convinced that um, if you want to be a technological leader, sustainability is going to be at the heart of it. And exporting our technology and exporting our models, that can have a tremendous impact on, on, on the world. And uh, things have changed within the European Union on, on how we achieve that. Uh, everyone in the European Union is a big fan of this internal market. This internal market has been such a source of, uh, of prosperity and, and especially for a small open economy like Belgium, we, we, we know how valuable this is for us. But up to now, the single market was one thing, but we've never had an economic policy that was at the size of that single market. Up to now, economic policy, every country was a little bit doing, uh, doing their own thing. For the first time with this uh, resilience and recovery facility, this is the first time that the European Union has an economic policy that is at the same size as the single market. For the first time, we now have a plan where 27 economies are going in the same direction, where 27 uh, locomotives are pulling in the same direction. I'm convinced that the impact of that will multiplicate what we already have with, um, with, uh, with, with the single market. We now finally are leveraging the single market into a common economic policy, a com common economic policy where sustainability really is at, uh, is at the heart. And that's good for Europe and it should be good for the rest of the world as well. Well, thank you. And uh, it's very interesting also that uh, the 750 billion in stimulus uh, is uh, focusing on uh, the green transition, but also then on the digital 
uh, transition. And these are the new technologies that you alluded to, uh, Prime Minister. And what role do you think uh, also more concrete these new technologies uh, can play? We know that, for example, the price of solar fell to one-tenth in 10 years. The price mm -hmm. of wind fell to one-seventh in 10 years. No one really predicted this, but that was what happened when you put all the policy, to policy tools uh, together and you got uh, our creativity there. But we also know that uh, this has to happen when it comes to carbon capture, storage, and sequestration. We know this also has to come when it comes to uh, really also uh, getting CO2 uh, out of the uh, air and etc. But are you and Europe ready to take the leadership here and apply the new technologies, but also put even more of the policy tools together to make sure that these new technologies that I just mentioned are also going to be as uh, competitive as uh, the renewables in some areas have become uh, the last decade? Yeah, Barker, very, very interesting that, that, that you make that point. Because we now have throughout Europe a big discussion on the fact that energy prices are going up. And um, if, there, if you look at the different technologies, I mean, the sustainable technologies are the only ones where the cost of energy is going down. Uh, fossil fuels, the costs are going up. Nuclear, the costs are basically more or less, uh, more or less stable. But renewables, year over year, the costs are going down, and they're going down in a very dramatic way. So, if you want to have lower cost energy, well, putting your bet on renewable energy is the way to drive the cost of energy uh, down. That's the first element. Second element, of course, is that there is a geopolitical uh, dimension to it. And, and as a European Union, well, we need to be more energy independent. And being more energy independent, obviously sustainable or renewable energy will play a role in that. There is an element, uh, a bit of a caveat into that, that of course we know that a lot of the renewable energy sources has some dependence related to certain, uh, certain materials, but that should push us to be stronger on recycling those rare materials, stronger in, in upcycling these, uh, these rare uh, materials. What you said about uh, carbon capture and, and, and so on, if I look at the different investment plans of, of the European countries, you see that there is a very big focus on carbon capture, on uh, pipelines for CO2, on hydrogen um, uh, investments and, and, and so on. And in Belgium, we will play an important role in that because we are at the crossroads of so many means of transportation with our harbors, but also with our, uh, with our pipelines. So coming back at what I uh, put in my previous answer, for the first time, we are using our scale. And by using our scale, um, we really can, can reap the benefits of, um, of, of the economies of scale in, 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 deploying, uh, in deploying technology. Thank you. Last question uh, to you, Prime Minister. You mentioned it uh, yourself that uh, the soaring energy prices uh, in Europe, no gas prices, and there has been less wind in the UK and etc. Uh, they're really now uh, peaking. And we know that the pandemic also has, in some countries, led to increased uh, inequalities. So this is going to be, I guess, a very uh, delicate uh, political handling uh, in the winter because uh, you need to make sure that the path towards a green transition continues. But um, what kind of policy tools can you use then with this kind of uh, soaring uh, energy prices without losing the momentum on the green uh, transition. Because we know higher energy prices is something that really gets people uh, into the streets. Yes, and, 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 and rightly so. Uh, it, it, this energy transition will never happen in a successful way if a big part of the population is feeling that they only have the negatives, only have, have the drawbacks of, uh, of that. So that, that social dimension, I think everyone is very well aware that uh, we, need to, uh, we need to cope with that. And, and um, well, there, there's two ways of looking at it. Uh, you, could, you could say a bit in a populist way, well, you see this is an issue and let's not do the transition. 
Uh, or you could look at it more in detail and understand that the rising prices actually are rising because of, uh, because of fossil fuel, um, and then take action on, on how to deal with it. In our uh, resilience and recovery uh, plan, uh, a big part, so it's approximately 1 billion, is actually being, being invested in, um, in, uh, in making our, our housing and our buildings uh, more, uh, more sustainable. And this is the only way. The only way forward is well. Every every energy that is not being used has the biggest benefit um, from a social uh, from a social perspective. We are very much aware of that. We know also that there is a discussion now on expanding the ETS uh, system to uh, to other domains such as transportation and and, uh, and 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 housing, for example. Well, if we do that, we need to be aware of the social uh, the social dimension. But in the end, giving more people access to sustainable energy, knowing that that domain is a domain where the prices are decreasing, or giving more people access to that type of energy is the best way to avoid that the social impact would be, uh, would be too big. And seeing that now the negative social impact is caused by fossil fuel is, 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 is a great way to, uh, to convince people and to, uh, to push people in a long-term good direction. Thank you so much, Prime Minister. Thank you, Alexander. Uh, thank you for your leadership and thank you for joining us uh, again. This is a great segue uh, to uh, your neighbor, uh, Feke uh, Sibasma uh, in uh, the Netherlands. Uh, Feke is uh, currently uh, the chair of Philips. He's also the honorary chair of DSM. But uh, in this context, even more important, he is uh, co-chairing uh, also, uh, the CEO um, Climate Leaders Alliance and the Green Transformation uh, of uh, Europe in this context. So, if I get listening to the Prime Minister, no, but also looking at uh, what needs to be done, I think we really have to count on the global companies taking a lead here. And uh, how much uh, walking off the talk do you expect in the coming year? of uh, the global CEOs and the global uh, companies. When do we know when it's real and know when do we know it's like um, a, a grinning exercise only? <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Borger, and uh, also Prime Minister De Croo of Belgium with uh, full commitment uh, to addressing this topic. And as we all have seen with the forest fires in Greece and Turkey and Italy and the floodings in Belgium and Germany and the Netherlands, uh, Canada, Australia, but also here in Europe. Uh, climate change is real, climate change is happening right now. So the European Green Deal, I think, with uh, Vice President Timmermans uh, has been pushing with support of um, Prime Ministers like Alexander de Croo, but also, of course, the President um, Ursula von der Leyen is, is very important. Uh, we need to realize that 80% of all the investments of the transition need to come from the private sector uh, and not from the public sector. So therefore, as you know very well, Borger, what we uh, did is setting up this European Green Deal CEO support group next to, we'll talk later, the CEO climate leader. So we have two groups of CEOs supporting climate change. One is the European Green Deal supporters and one is the CEO climate leaders. And what do we do? We, we embrace um, uh, what Europe is going to do here and we try to fill that in. Uh, what can we do as companies? On the mitigation and on the adaptation area, I think um, the IPCC report indicates we are already living in a one and a half degrees Celsius world, whether we like it or not. So we need to learn to adapt also uh, to the floodings, to the fires, etc. And we need to further mitigate. As Franz Timmermans is saying it, um, it is not only that we need to take our responsibility for climate, which is very costly, etc. No, it will provide also economic growth. It will provide jobs. It will provide competitiveness. And at the end of the day, the whole world needs to change so if Europe can change faster and Europe can adapt faster, then it could create also an economic benefit. And many companies see the same and therefore they join. What do we do? We support agricultural transformation from farm to fork. We support the 
issues we have with mobility, by electrical cars, by different forms of energy, and of course, the way of living and, and housing. So those three areas are very important. We hope that at the COP, the 100 billion transition um, uh, will also be filled in because we need uh, to adapt. I would like to add also biodiversity as a topic. And this whole group, we have now 50 members supporting the European Green Deal. I go to here together with Thomas Bubler of AXA. And uh, it's not a lobby group. It is a support group to governments like Prime Minister De Croo, like Vice President Timmermans, uh, realizing that major part of the solution has to come from the private sector. Thank you, Falke. Uh, we'll come uh, back to you. Any short comment from your Prime Minister to what Falke just said, the role of business? Um, I, I couldn't agree more with what, uh, what Falke has, uh, ha has said. And, and, and maybe we could link it a bit to the way we, uh, we handled COVID. I mean, we, we handled COVID by using technology. Um, the restraining measures of uh, lockdowns and others I mean, those were not very sustainable ways of dealing with it. The way we dealt with it was with vaccines. And we, de we developed vaccines. I mean, no one would ever have thought a year ago that today uh, most European countries would bear vaccination levels of more than 80% of, um, of, of, of the adult population. How did they do it? Well, by putting together, every one of us, uh, what we're best at. Uh, the academic world, at all the research that has been done over the last, uh, the last decades, actually, in the mRNA uh, technology. The uh, public sector, uh, by putting our, uh, our financing, by putting our stability, by guaranteeing the fact that we would be uh, taking, uh, taking volumes, and the private sector, by really, I mean, putting this, 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 this applied innovation, um, and, and, and the private sector, by working together. I mean, what we have seen between some pharmaceutical companies is amazing. Is yeah. saying company A is saying to company B, you know, you shouldn't try this path because we did it and it's it's not working. Try something else. I mean, that type of cooperation um, is uh, is is something unseen, and and I think it should uh, it should inspire all of us in tackling something. And and climate change has a lot of the same characteristics as a pandemic. I mean, a lot of people over the last years over the last months understood what is an exponential development. An exponential development means that at some point the acceleration is beyond control and that you cannot intervene anymore. We've seen that in the pandemic and we, we've suffered to it. Actually with climate change it's the same. There is a point where the development is just out of control. And so the only way to do it I think is by uh, working together, uh, putting, um, well, it's a bit the multi-stakeholder approach that the World Economic Forum has been advocating for so, uh, for so long. So yeah. now is the moment. And, uh, and I think COVID should inspire us in, in tackling this other uh, big issue, uh, which is uh, climate change. Thank you, Prime Minister. Uh, Merrick, uh, that's a good segue uh, into uh, the two other panelists uh, too, uh, from the private sector. Thank you so much. I'd like to go to uh, Alison Martin. Um, Alison, you're at Zurich Insurance and uh, your company in particular and insurance companies overall, they, they uh, are very close to how we monitor global risks. So we've been working with your company for a while on uh, the risk of uh, climate change. Um, I know that um, your company made uh, a recent commitment to decrease its carbon footprint. You've announced uh, that you want to decrease business flights for company employees by up to 70%. You want to shift uh, more to um, uh, digital communication with customers. Uh, you want to do a remote customer service assistance and use more electric and hybrid company cars. And, and really congratulations on this leadership. Now. Within the insurance sector, you work with all other companies, all other sectors. So I'm curious how you see the preparedness and the willingness of all the other sectors to do similar things, uh, to, to really step up vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis this very transformative challenge that we all face. Over to you, Alison. Thank you. I, I think it, it's clear that there are I think the way that Prime Minister De Cruz said it is exactly how we would agree. 
that this is about industry actors, it's multi-stakeholders working together to make transformative change. It's not something that any individual organization or any individual government can tackle. It truly is a climate change is one of the most existential risks we face. It will require all of us working together. I mean, if, I, if I give the example of the, we were one of the founding members of the Net Zero Asset Owners Alliance, which was convened by the United Nations. Um, and likewise, we're one of the founding members of the Net Zero Insurance Alliance. Um, in order to, well, why? Well, the industry has to come together um, in a non in a non anti competitive way, but to provide the means by which we can do one of the most important things, which is provide transparency and measurement, so that our industry, which is not a polluting industry, I mean we're, we're a, we are we're a financial services organisation. So yes, we believe it's critical to walk the talk. So things like reducing air travel is a key component of that because that's a very visible emission. However, for us, what's far more important is the financing of emissions. So the actions we take on our balance sheet, on the investment side and the underwriting side. But we can't take action in isolation. We need to do it in conjunction with the companies who we invest in and the companies who we insure so that we can work towards a positive transition together rather than in isolation. So you do that by measurement. You do that by having an industry-wide agreed methodology, science-based targets. So we're all talking the same language. So we don't have barriers between the languages that different industry sectors use. So I think it's a really important step that the industry is coming together in financial services, has done through the Asset Owners Alliance. I mean, Europe has nearly 10.5 trillion, which the largest institutional investment group is through the institutional ownership of asset managers and insurance companies. So we have great power to be able to affect change and to support transition. Thank you, Alison. And uh, you're a global company, uh, so you work uh, in every corner of the world. Uh, so uh, in terms of the uh, leadership of Europe, the industry leadership of Europe in this respect, do you see then other geographies um, following the lead of uh, some of the action that European companies are, are taking? This Clearly differences, and I recognize it's a very complex web of geopolitics and macroeconomics at play. It's not, a, it's not a straightforward puzzle to solve. Otherwise, we would have done it as society, as governments, as businesses decades ago, arguably when we had a much better chance of being able to be effective. And, and Prime Minister de Croo was talking about, sadly, the, the impact, as was a FICA, on, on actual the physical risk of climate change, which is crystallizing year in, year out. I mean, we, there was $210 billion of natural catastrophe events last year. That's economic losses. Um, now, and that's, that doesn't count then the human costs. So, so this is real, it's here and now. Now, yes, to, to your question, we absolutely see there are differences around the world. And if you just look at who are the founding members of the Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance and who are the founding members of the Net Zero Insurance Alliance, you can clearly see that Europe is taking the lead. And I would very much agree with what's previously been said, that I think that puts Europe in a fantastic place to take the lead in innovation, in developing the technologies that can then be used at scale in the rest of the world. This is Europe's chance. Thank you. And maybe just a, 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 one very quick follow up on farming. The Prime Minister mm -hmm. mentioned how important it is yeah. uh, to work with this sector. You're involved in a lighthouse project mm -hmm. that we house within the community that yeah. FICA mentioned. Uh, any learnings from that work of that community and how we can bring this sector along uh, to the European Green Deal? So I, I think we feel very humble and very privileged to be working as part of this Lighthouse project. So it's the, the Europe, European Carbon Farming Coalition. And, and it absolutely recognizes that you need to bring everybody along the journey, whether it's the smallholder farmer, whether it's the delivery, it's the entire value chain of farming needs to get together in order to understand what are the critical pain points from farm to fork um, and how can they be solved. Now, finance is clearly a part of that, but it's the coming together of the entire value chain that's going to make a difference. And I think the approach that's being taken to these lighthouse projects is, is to exactly do that, is to convene all the participants within that value chain for each industry to be able to say, how can we help mitigate one of these pain points? And I think that's definitely the way forward. 
Thank you so much, Allison. Let me move to Stefan Scheibler at Roland Berger, a professional services company based in Germany, but a global one. Uh, first, we had a little chat before. Um, uh, your company has also, of course, made commitments uh, around net zero. Uh, what, what is the role of professional services companies in general, in your view, uh, in the framework of the European Green Deal? I'd say we have to take our own responsibility, so we have the target to be carbon negative in 2028, but this will not make the game in the end. There are other sectors that are much more important. So I think the role of professional service companies is to support the companies in other segments to do their job, uh, to come back to what was said before. I think the good news is that after the American presidential election, where Donald Trump, let's say, was for some companies the the uh, only option to somehow hope to avoid uh, that uh, the carbon neutral game will come, this has gone, and, and all companies we give advice to being a strategy consultancy have understood that. I think the basis is stable. Carbon neutrality is a long-term trend where you have to go. Digitization is a long-term trend where you have to go. And so you just have to take the opportunity, and that was said before, to be uh, more competitive and to tap the uh, tremendous growth potentials. And, and that is, I'd say, actually what we are really doing. We uh, inserted in every project we do a climate impact assessment uh, component, so to interact with the client on the on the uh, climate impact dimension. And I'd say in 90% of the projects, they want to do that. And it's really to go through their own business model. Is it, uh, let's say, sustainable regarding climate change? Uh, we can go through products and services. What is the climate impact of their products and services? And also in the third dimension, what is their own footprint? And they highly appreciate that. And then you go for follow-up things like transport decarbonizer for consumer goods companies, for logistic companies, energy decarbonizer to, to make it very practical. And one good thing, because I think we are all European, uh, us being the only leading consultancy of European origin, it's really a brand advantage to uh, to be from Europe because credibility in America and, and Asia is, is very high for Europe. So we shouldn't underestimate that role. And, Prime Minister De Croo said, uh, we cannot fix it by Europe, but what we can do if we really play the game, have uh, leading edge pro uh, products and use it as a tool for innovation and, and being more competitive, we can contribute dramatically to the uh, steps forward in other regions of the world. I think what's uh, worth to go for it as, as Europe and as European companies. And uh, th this is actually, we are strongly benefiting from that. Thank you. Um, and my follow-up question is around uh, Germany. You're originally based in Germany, even if you're a global company. We have elections coming up. Um, but around the preparedness of the, of the German industry to really support uh, the European Green Deal, you had a recent study uh, published by your firm uh, where you talk about uh, innovation, how innovation can help curb carbon emissions, and you uh, talk about uh, uh, three key areas for the ecosystem to really function, energy efficiency, sustainable water management, and sustainable mobility. Uh, so particularly the mobility sector, um, how, how prepared uh, is the sector really to support the green transition, and what will it do to its competitiveness, you think, uh, going forward? So having a look at uh, European car manufacturers and especially the German ones, I'd say three, four years, I had severe fears because it's in the German GDP, 12, 13%, depending how you calculate uh, that they are contributing. I think they made it finally by, by uh, going uh, straight in the direction of uh, electrical vehicles and cars. And uh, you were mentioning the German elections. I think there will be a, a, a government in, with any outcome that may come, and this is very, very unpredictable, actually, how it finally goes, but most probably the Green Party will uh, be part of, of a government. And so for the, the governmental side, the challenge will really be to go with instruments that are as close to the market as possible, so carbon uh, trading to find the right way for depreciation and, and, and 
activate investments in, in sustainable technologies in, in Europe and else to really push moderation in one direction. So uh, if you want to secure the electrical car, uh, let's say charging station policy, we are far ahead from fulfilling the expected demand. So the public side also really has to speed up. And if we take the industrial sector, uh, to give the security to a steel producer to go for an erect, uh, electrical based uh, steel production, uh, what is not, uh, let's say, profitable, actually, you really have to give a very reliable regulation from the political side, and that counts for Europe and all European countries where we are not yet there. So the quality expectations to the government will raise dramatically. And I think this is the biggest challenge. So we were in Germany, there were, was more than a decade of growth that was interrupted by COVID. Perhaps that was a wake up call. And we now will have to change dramatically to get these things fixed. So I'm not pessimistic. I, I grew up in public sector business. And if they get the right political guidance, uh, normally people working in public sector can be pretty efficient, at least in, in, in Europe is, is my conviction. But these are tremendous challenges. Just to finalize with one additional example, if we replace the fossil fuels in the mobility sector by electricity, if we replace in the industrial sector many parts of the production chain by electricity, in Germany, the need for electricity will double to triple, perhaps even more in the next decades. And how to get permitting processes sped up. And all those things are tremendous challenges. So. Uh, my message is it's understood in the industry and with the services companies, uh, but it will be, we all together have to find a clever interaction between public sector and private sector to get that all fixed. And this, this will be so uh, a very interesting decade we have ahead of us. And uh, as a consultancy, there is a lot to do. Yeah. Stefan Scheibel, thank you so much. A pivotal moment in Germany and Europe. I'd like to hand over floor, the floor back to Borge Brende and also Feike. Uh, for the last uh, four minutes we have. Thank you, uh, Marek. Uh, this has been a fascinating uh, discussion. I knew with such a great panel uh, that would also be uh, the case, but um, one has uh, to uh, deliver. Fike, you listen to um, the other uh, panelists. We know that you're spending a lot of your time now on mobilizing private sector, also in the run-up to COP26, but the whole green transition uh, globally is something that is very close to your heart. I think um, both you and I have been uh, to many COPs uh, throughout the years and there has been ups and downs. I was uh, this last year when we have seen also the tremendous impact that climate change is already having on our planet. Uh, our planet is really on fire. I was hoping that this would be like another Paris breakthrough in Glasgow. It would be very interesting uh, to hear uh, how you feel about the prospects. And if we don't get everything we want at COP26, what is our plan not to lose momentum in the years to come? And as you said, 80% of the investments that uh, is needed for mitigation has to come from the private sector. So there is no way uh, around the private sector. Over to you. You can do the summing up and you have two minutes. Thank you very much, Borger. My question to the governmental leaders at the COP, because the COP is in first instance meant for governmental leaders. They have the power there. Why would you not come to a deal? And I give you a false argument. Why not come to a deal? Because you're afraid as a government that this deal will cost you money, will go at the detriment of your competitiveness, of the economic growth, of jobs. And I tell you that that is a private sector thing. And the private sector is asking you, governments, to take bold actions. So it will not go at the cost of your economic growth, nor jobs, nor competitiveness. Now we ask you to take fierce actions to reduce the emissions, to go to net zero by 2050, and a clear roadmap towards the goal with intermediate step by 2030 with being totally transparent as a private sector as well on your emissions and the financial implications of climate-related matters, TCFD. And also, we as a private sector urge you to put a price on carbon, a meaningful price on carbon, in as many as possible jurisdictions to get the transition done. So the private sector is asking you, please team up with us 
and we are not resistant like maybe the private sector was 20 years ago. We are even supporting you to take more and stronger actions. It's possible you get our support. So I don't see any reason why not to move ahead. Uh, that will be my call to the important governmental leaders who have all the power at the COP. Well, thank you uh, so much, Fike. You're also great on timing. It's 29.59 and you ended on that. I would again say thank you uh, to this uh, great panel. Uh, the SDI summit uh, will also touch on climate change issues uh, in the days to come. Thank you so much to my colleague here, um, uh, Mirek Dusek, and also to uh, Teresa Bellardo, that is a driving uh, force behind the whole this green recovery uh, Europe uh, deal. And of course, our two co-chairs, uh, Fike and Thomas. Thank you so much for joining us and see you soon. Bye.